Welcome to our webinar, State of the Art in Big Compute, on-premise, hybrid, and in the cloud. My name is Mika Peggers, and I'm a Product Marketing Manager here at Rescale. And thank you for joining today's discussion on how you can leverage the cloud and your on-premise HPC together to get the best cost and performance for your particular needs. To help tell this story, we have Gabriel Broner, our VP and GM of HPC here at Rescale, presenting. Gabriel has a storied career in HPC. Starting in the early 90s at Cray, then later working as GM at Microsoft, Head of Innovation at Ericsson, and VP and GM of HPC at SGI, now HPE. Firmly believing that cloud is the future of HPC, Gabriel came to Rescale to shine the light on how enterprises can incorporate cloud into their HPC installations. Today, Gabriel will first walk us through some trends in the industry, then discuss the benefits and use cases that make cloud compelling. He'll talk about how you can implement a hybrid cloud on-premise HPC strategy that can help make your HPC more dynamic and responsive to your needs. All right, Gabriel, go ahead. Happy to be here. I spent about uh, 25 years with on-premise HPC at places like Cray and SGI. And now I spend three months at a startup, Rescale, and life as a, at a startup moves very fast. So three months here feels right now like I've been at Rescale for quite some time. And the interesting thing for me is after 25 years on premise, I had some beliefs about how HPC needs to work and needs to exist on premises. Coming to Rescale, I spent the majority of my time thinking about how I could um, take advantage of cloud in an HPC environment, both using on-premises, using cloud, using a hybrid world. So that's what I'm going to share with you today, a bit of the history that I've lived through in terms of HPC on-premises. And then as we go to um, in the cloud, what are the opportunities we have? So I'm going to start first with the agenda, cover high performance computing in general, then high performance computing on-premises, and it has been a story of evolution and a story of a disruption. So I'm going to talk about that. And I'm going to talk about HPC in the cloud. What are the benefits? What are the use cases? What is needed in the cloud for HPC? And cover a little bit about what Rescale does in order to address that. And at this third item, I'm going to cover hybrid, HPC on premises and in the cloud, and I'd like to talk about incorporating cloud in HPC. So if you have an on-premise HPC installation, how do you add cloud and how are you how can you be effective at that and talk about the future so i'm going to start first so you know what is high performance computing uh, throughout my life since so joining cray 1991 through my years at sgi uh, we tackle the problems that engineers and scientists deal and effectively engineers and scientists push in the edges and the boundaries of science and engineering. So people who are designing planes, today when you design a plane, you design it completely in the computer and then when you finish the plane flies. Very different than the old style of having the wind tunnels where you have to just build parts and put them um, in the physical wind tunnel. In oil and gas, uh, people um, are looking at where to drill the next oil well. So finding the next oil well and having better probability of finding oil, it ends up being a very exciting proposition for oil companies. So buying a, a big supercomputer to do that ends up being cost effective as it gives them good ROI. In automotive, designing of the car and doing car crashing all in the computer <coughs> gives you the possibility um, to basically have safer cars and, and improve time to market. In life sciences, we see now a movement towards what we can call personalized medicine, uh, where instead of just having the same treatment and the same drugs for everyone, when you go to the doctor, the doctor will be able to take a DNA sample and decide for your illness and for your DNA, this is the treatment. So as you can see, uh, the reality is high performance computing is really uh, changing lives, and it's, it's, that's such that's exciting for me about this field. So I've been excited to be all these years, and I'll try to share a bit of that experience. Let's talk first about HPC on-premises. And sometimes I think uh, HPC on-premises has been a history of disruptions. So if you look at uh, the picture on the left, you see Seymour Cray standing, and many people consider Seymour Cray the father of supercomputing. Um, Seymour Cray, um, build this machine, the Cray-1. Uh, if you look at the shape of the machine today, it may look kind of odd, but you may have seen pictures of that. Uh, well, when I was at Cray, I understood quickly that the length of the cables made a difference in terms of the speed of the computer, how long it took 
uh, for the electrons to go from one board to the next one. And the way to reduce the distances was to build the machine in this radial way, so all the boards go in, and in the central part, the distances are very short. So when you're building the fastest computers in the world, you're very clear about your goal. I joined the company that says fastest computers in the world, and I was an engineer uh, working on operating systems. I knew I always have to go for speed. It was a very clear world that I lived in. So one of the things that happened when I joined in 1991 is this was this idea of massively parallel computer, which is this second machine here. And I work on the operating system for the Cray T3E. And what this was at the time, we called it the massively parallel machines. You can call today an HPC cluster. These were nodes that had a, a commodity or a standard CPU, a DEC alpha, its own memory and a high speed interconnect. So ahead of the times in, in the 1990s, we worked on this machine. And I have to tell you, when we went through this transition, many people told us, you know, this is not gonna be as fast as the original craze. Well, in the end, I think it didn't matter because the traditional craze that every CPU was multiple boards and very special are not built anymore. Today, what we have is the equivalent of the follow-on of these HPC clusters. Then uh, SGI bought Cray, so I became part of SGI in 1996. And what we faced is a move to the Intel processor. And when we moved to the Intel processor, I was part of the team that said, you know, we can either port the proprietary operating system, IRIX, or we can put uh, Linux. And Linux was considered at the time a toy operating system, which made people very uncomfortable. But our belief was that Linux will get better. Applications are going to be written for Linux much more than for the proprietary operating system. So the future was going to be Linux. But if you think about the time when I started telling customers, we're going to put Linux in the next supercomputer, they all looked at us like we're crazy. And the reality is, well, we were seeing that Linux is going to evolve and applications were going to be there and it was going to be better for the customer. But this discomfort of Linux being developed by the open source community and not by a vendor and not being able to commit when exactly you're going to get features was a very strange change for people and very uncomfortable. Now, after we explained it multiple times, it went from customers saying, that's a crazy idea, Gabriel, to that's not so crazy anymore. And eventually they adopted it. So, so uh, I view that as yet another disruption or yet another change. And then um, this machine here actually is the machine at NASA um, that we solved in around 2004. This machine is the machine that made the shuttle go back in space. So it was very exciting times. The shuttle had been stopped for a number of, uh, probably a couple of years because they had the accident and they needed a machine that could simulate re-entry fast enough. Uh, when we uh, built this machine, it was taking two months to simulate re-entry. After this machine, they were able to simulate re-entry in an hour or two hours. So the, the, the machine at NASA uh, called Columbia uh, ended up being a big change for NASA and, and a big motivation for the people that just volunteer time to build this huge machine in-house and be able to uh, just simply um, enable NASA to make this happen. NASA today has this other machine um, that we call Pleiades, and this machine today is based off standard Intel 2 CPU nodes. So if you think about it, um, we went from a very expensive and proprietary world that was a and built by Simmer Cray, to now these are two CPU Intel nodes. And all these changes sort of happen, in a sense, maybe gradually, uh, for people who've been 20 years in the industry, but it's a huge change. So we went from the proprietary world to now pretty much all the supercomputers from all the vendors look about the same under the covers. So we can say that it's been a process of commoditization too. So the other thing that I thought was interesting to mention is the performance increase. Uh, normally we measure flops as floating point operations per second, uh, how much, uh, how many operations per second you can do. Um, and the Cray one is 160 mega flop. After mega you have giga and after giga you have teraflop. So 20 years later, the Cray MPP had one teraflop basically in this big machine. Um, and so this was many times more than a thousand times this machine, just to give you a sense. Um, if you go to the SGI Altix, this was 60 teraflops. So 10 years later, almost two orders of magnitude more. And now about another 10 years later, or maybe 15 years later, is another 10 times. So the increases in performance have been amazing. About uh, every 10 years, 
about a hundred times the performance. So this is actually sorry, about a, almost a hundred times the performance. So as if you go 10 years to 10 years, you see the performance increase be a hundred times. Just to give you a sense of performance today, I would probably place the iPhone 7 slightly below this Cray MPP and the iPhone 8 above the Cray MPP in terms of performance. So this machine that occupied this whole floor uh, today, it's basically an iPhone. So that's been the performance increases. So if you look at the curve, you can see here that in, an, in a logarithmic chart, uh, it looks linear in terms of performance increase of the machines in what's called the top 500 list, which is sort of the, um, the, the measurement of the biggest machines in the world. And it's kind of interesting that it's linear and it's about 100 times every 10 years. The other thing that has happened over the last several years is the performance has increased pretty much um, growing, as I said, linearly for the single, um, single CPU. But what's been happening over the last few years, it's been flattening. So the single thread performance can continue to grow the way it was growing in the past, it was called Moore's Law, um, because you start reaching a plateau on how much you know the distances uh, inside the chip and also the power you're generating. So. You, you just cannot generate more watts in a chip without burning it. So you're reaching a problem of performance cannot increase linearly as it had before. And that has led to multiple architectures. So what happens now is um, you can buy an Intel CPU like Xeon, or you can buy an Intel Xeon Phi like KNL, or you can buy an NVIDIA GPU like the K80 or the P100, or you can buy an FPGA or a TPU. So, all these give you possibilities. For example, GPUs are popular with deep learning and artificial intelligence and some particular applications in, in high performance computing, while CPUs may be, in general, what people are using today because they are general purpose and they're not specialized for one space. But one of the challenges our customers were asking me when I was at SGI until a few months ago is, what architecture should I buy next? Because with this variety, now it's not so easy. It used to be you just buy a CPU and that's it. So one of the challenges people are facing today is how do I split my machine? How do I make it one way or another? How do I have the flexibility to have GPUs, CPUs, whatever I need for my workloads in the future? With that, I wanted to talk about a couple of machines <laughs> that I, I, was, I was involved in. Um, the Pangea uh, machine at Total, um, it's, it's an SGI system, and today it's the biggest system in industry. Uh, the two, you know, all these big machines I'm talking about may cost around $30 million. And so over, over the history of all the machines I show you, that had been the price of a big machine at the time, even if the performance was, you know, 100 times less 10 years ago. That's kind of the price of one of these big machines. So Total does, uses this machine to do oil exploration and reservoir simulation. So where do I drill the next oil well? And then how do I optimize the oil extraction after I, I drill the oil well? So in a sense, uh, Total has the biggest machine in the world. It's also, sorry, the biggest machine in the industry in the world. It's also uh, the biggest machine in Europe today. So it's a pretty, pretty big system. And that was kind of the, you know, NASA, Total, these are the kind of big machines we saw at SGI and where we focus on this was kind of the high. We didn't try to go after the top 10 machines that were more specialized, like the machines sold to the Department of Energy, etc. A very specialized machine with more uh, particular purpose, particular architecture. These were general purpose machines sold to the um, Total, but also sold to the car companies doing car crashing, etc. Uh, this is another interesting machine that we sold uh, last year at SGI, and this is the NCAR system, National Center of Atmospheric Research, uh, called Cheyenne. Uh, what they do is weather and climate. So um, at NCAR, they try to figure out how climate is going to change over the next 10 years, and they need to do a lot of computation to do that, but they also need a lot of data. So these people manage 50 years of data to figure out, you know, if they do projections of climate, they can apply those. They, if they develop a model, they can use 50 years of data to test the model to see if really predicts well what happened already, and they can use that to predict the future. They also do things like uh, predict precipitation for the next year. So they decide what people can decide what plants to crop, sorry, what crops uh, to plant in one uh, location. Um, and they can also use it to uh, to predict hurricane paths very accurately down, down to the county level. So you need that compute power to have the resolution of the system. So we're talking about machines of, 
you know, five to seven uh, petaflops or something like that in, in it for that amount of money. So this was uh, what I wanted to cover about HPC on-premises, and now let me shift to HPC in the cloud, which is sort of in part what motivated me to come to Rescale, but in part what I've been discovering by digging in and finding out more about how things are different in the world of, in the cloud. So first, uh, when you do HPC in the cloud, different than on-premises, you have instant access to unlimited resources. So you can think that instead of having a fixed machine that I have on-premises that I can run at very high speed, like these specialized machines that I show you, um, what I have is I don't have a machine. So when I need to run a simulation, I can ask for a thousand CPUs, get them right away and run the simulation. The other interesting thing is that uh, I can have a choice of architectures. One of the challenges I mentioned that people have when buying HPC on premises is I can uh, buy a machine with CPUs or GPUs or split the machine half and half, half CPUs and half GPUs. But the challenge I have with that is if I have free GPUs, it's not going to help me to run uh, an application that needs CPUs. So the interesting thing of the cloud is I can run this application that I have to run right now uses GPUs, so I run it on many GPUs. This other application I need to run at the same time or later needs CPUs, I can run it on CPUs. So I really have a choice of architectures. The other thing is you can have applications available in Tune, and that's, that's exactly what we do at Rescale. At Rescale, we have about 220 applications that are already ported in tune to run in all these possible architectures. So when you need to do car crashing, you're gonna select the application and you're gonna be able to run it. And it's gonna recommend where to run it best because you have all these multiple architectures in front of you. So the applications effectively will run on the best suited architecture. The other thing you can think about, sometimes you need the highest speed for, for a job to run. And that one you can run on the latest uh, Intel CPU with the fastest interconnect. But some applications may not need the fastest interconnect and they can just use Etheret. Or some particular application uh, may not need to run on the fastest CPU. So you can save money by running it on a slower CPU. So what cloud does for you, in a, in a sense, is it matches the needs of the job with the architecture. The other thing that I found very interesting in just thinking through this that I didn't realize three months ago is jobs uh, run with no weight. So when I have, when I'm used to working at a, with a Cray or an SGI system, you queue your jobs with a job scheduler and the jobs are waiting in a queue to run. So they're probably gonna run in one of the fastest machines in the world, but if the machine is busy, you'll have to wait in the queue. And then in general, these HPC systems are highly utilized because you don't wanna buy a $30 million machine and have it sort of lightly loaded so you can always run immediately. So the machines are highly utilized, which means you, you, your job will be queued and run when it's available. When you're running in the cloud, you can run instantly because there's always uh, CPUs available in the cloud. So then you have to think for yourself, is it better to wait in a queue for a while and then run on a faster machine, or would it be better to run right away with no wait, even if the CPU is slightly slower or something, I can start right away and maybe I can finish my simulation in total time sooner than I would have if I had waited in the queue. The other thing is the engineers are not constrained by the size of the system. This is something I would hear from my customers at SCI saying, you know, what I cannot really handle is when somebody shows up with a big job to run and I ask them, how often are you going to run this big job? And they, they, the engineers say, I don't know, I want to run it once, see what results I get. And after that, I'll decide if I need to run it more or not, or we're going to kill the project. So if you're in the cloud, you need the thousand CPUs right now, you go get them, and then you don't need them anymore, you return them, and you only pay per usage, both for hardware and for software. So this allows for faster innovation, uh, shorter simulation cycles, that leads to overall improved time to market. The other thing is uh, immediate provision, right? So. Um, People tell me in the traditional HPC world, if I need to buy a new machine, the, the whole process of procurement, installation, provision, etc., that takes six to 18 months. Well, if you need a lot of CPUs in the cloud, you can get them today because they're there. Then variable size is attractive because now you're not tied to the complete um, size of the machine. And no capital investment seems to be a request I have been getting from from many of our customers that their CFO or somebody saying, you know, 
instead of spending 30 million dollars next time can we put this in the cloud or can we do half in the cloud and half on premises can i have a dial between how much in the cloud how much on premises do i have so things that have changed in my mind is system utilization which is something you care about in on premise system you want to be highly utilized so you you really using your your asset that you spend a lot of money for um, doesn't exist anymore job queues don't exist anymore because you have a job to run you run it right away so there's no need for a scheduler uh, those of us who grew up in hpc scheduler was part of life that's what you always had um, well you don't need one when you're running in the cloud because you can just submit jobs and you have cpus to run and the other thing that we probably all got used to is downtimes. You may have, you know, downtime so you can do an upgrade or you can do maintenance or you can do things like that. So no downtimes in the cloud because effectively you don't have to stop your big system to do an upgrade. So this becomes things of the past that are positive things. I wanted to share here. Um, one of the rescale customers is an automotive supplier, supplier, and they have the following challenge. Okay, this is my workload painting here in peaks and valleys in black. So sometimes I have a lot to run, sometimes I have a very little to run. Well, what happens when that's your workload and you want to buy a system in-house, you can either say, I'm going to buy a system size for the peaks, and that's going to cost me a lot of money, like $20 million is going to be lightly utilized. So um, this is going to be a problem because a lot of money to have a system lightly utilized so I can always run the jobs I need to run. Or I can buy a system that is on the blue line, which is the typical situation, say $4 million. In that case, it's going to be highly utilized, but the problem is we'll have to wait for a job to run until the system becomes available. So these peaks, some of the big jobs cannot run, some of the others will be queued and it will be run later when there's space. So that's a challenge. I mean, do I spend four million and you know I use my money better, but I wait in a queue, or do I spend more money, like 20 million, which is probably a lot of money for an automotive company, and no queue wait, but idle time in the machine all the time. So they decided instead to use rescale. So with rescale, whenever you need something to run, you just ask for the CPUs you need and you get them. In that case, you don't worry about size of machine you just go and run the jobs you need to run when you need to run them and today they pay between 50 to 100k a month so instead of deciding if they should buy a four million dollar machine and waiting queue or a bigger machine to run as fast as possible by using rescale they spend 50 to 100k a month and they get the processors they need when they need them and they run without wait so i would say that the cost is comparable to having bought a $4 million machine because the depreciation of a $4 million machine is about 100K per month, 111K per month. But the reality is they're getting results as if they were running in a big machine with no weight. And that's the exciting thing about cloud. It matches the peaks and valleys of your workload in terms of giving you the CPUs you need when you need them. So here are some examples of some of the applications that have been traditionally used with high performance computing. And what I have here is, on the left is a physical uh, prototype of a car and you doing car crashing on a side impact and you're trying to figure out what's the impact of the dummy in the car. Well, in the right, you're doing that in the computer. They could be in, a, um, in an in-house computer or you can do it in the cloud. This is the kind of applications that people are doing today in the cloud. Now, what we're hearing from customers is now there's more compute power available. They don't only want to do the car crashing with the driver, they want to put, they want to figure out all the airbags and multiple passengers sitting in the car, which makes the problem more complex and they need more and more compute power. Here's another example of um, high forms computing that's been done in the cloud. And this is uh, actually Boeing, and this is the 787 wing design. And that's how the company was founded um, about six years ago. Um, Yoris and Adam, who are the founders of Rescale, were wing designers for the Boeing 787. And when they were designing the wing, they could not solve the problem with the machine in-house. It have taken them three months uh, to just run the job and they were under pressure to figure out um, what's the right design for the wing. And they ended up getting thousands of processors in a weekend and they just ran the job and they were able to figure that out in 24 hours. And that led to a lighter design of the 787 wing by 150 pounds it's only one piece 
And that means for the airlines, cost savings of $180 million through the life of a plane because they have to use less fuel to run that plane back and forth. So it's kind of an interesting result. And this was the motivation that led Yoris and Adam to come and start the company. And now six years later, um, basically our customers are able to do this using Rescale. Um, this is uh, SpaceX, and that's a company that um, they have to launch rockets. And when you launch rockets, you, you have effectively to do many simulations to make sure that you have a one-time opportunity um, to launch the rocket and either succeeds or fails. So the interesting thing here is if you have to do, they do close to 100,000 simulations before they launch, how do you do that? If you need to do that with a system in-house, um, you'll be queuing and running jobs one after another. One is going to take a long time. If you do it in the cloud, then you're able to do that very, very quickly. And that's what, in, that's what helped them uh, improve the overall time and the reliability of the rocket design before a launch. Here's another interesting example. This is Nano Racing. And um, what they've done is they, they do um, um, Formula One racing but they use Rescale to have a simulation just next to the track. So they have uh, access to the cloud and they have a simulated race happening inside Rescale. So as they run in the real race, what they do is they take the input data from the car, from the sensors in the car, and that data fits the model. So they do within a lab, they're able to do 3000 simulations in the virtual race inside Rescale. And with that, they're able to modify the race strategy uh, for the next lap. So it's kind of interesting example. Uh, sometimes this is called digital twins, which is the ability to have the real world and the virtual world sort of in parallel, but now take data from the real world and feed the virtual world. Here's another example that is quite interesting. This is a company, Boom, that designs um, supersonic airplanes for commercial flying. You, we all know that Concorde was an interesting engineering piece, but it was a flop in terms of business because it was too expensive. So what uh, Boom is doing, it's a startup designing the next um, supersonic plane for passengers where the cost is going to be equivalent to business class or first class. And, and the expectation is then you can have a very short flight from US to Europe at the cost of business class, first class. Um, and they already have um, airline companies that have ordered their planes to be ready you know, later in a few years. But one of the interesting things they do is they not only do all, they do all of the design using the Rescale Cloud, but they also have, for example, flight simulators where a pilot would be sitting on the flight simulator flying the virtual plane being designed today. So they can get a lot of feedback early on in the process by doing this. So these are all examples of HPC in the cloud today, real people doing real work and in, in getting significant work done. So what are the challenges for HPC in the cloud? I would say that first is you have to access many data centers. So one of the things uh, Rescale does, uh, we don't own any hardware. Rescale runs on top of hardware providers, uh, cloud providers like Amazon, Azure, Google or on top of supercomputing centers like Ohio Supercomputing Center that we can access their machine and submit jobs there. So effectively, when you come in to use Rescale, you'll be running on any of these architectures on the one uh, that makes the most sense and is more is better for your job. So that's, that's basically how we address it. The second thing that is addressed is geographies. Sometimes, for example, you're in Europe, and there's data privacy issues and you cannot leave Europe. So we have a platform in Europe, we have one, in, two in North America, et cetera. But if you're in Europe, you can run completely in Europe and you don't leave Europe to, to run on Rescale. I told you there was uh, 220 applications ported and tuned. Because we run on all these architectures, um, it's good that the applications are already available, ported and tuned and, and actually benchmarked. So when you come in, you'll be able to run the application, select the application you wanna run, pay for usage and run it um, on the best possible architecture for the job in terms of price or par price performance. So for example, um, there's this use cases of Abacus that runs better, run better on GPUs. So on the left, you have an example of running Abacus on AWS on a K80 GPU node 
because it gives you a 5x speed up over running it on CPUs. But later you want to run LSDyna, and LSDyna runs better on CPUs using a high-speed network like InfiniBand, and Microsoft Azure offers InfiniBand interconnected nodes, so we run LSDyna preferred on, on this Microsoft Azure. And then for the for TPU architectures, we have, uh, for TensorFlow, for example, we have uh, Google and we have access to TPUs and you get, um, you know, very high speed using Google in this case. So the point I'm, I'm trying to make here is by working in the cloud and having the multi-cloud environment, when you select the application to run, you're gonna get a recommendation or where best to run it. And this is gonna be pretty much uh, transparent or available to the user using Rescale. Challenges in, in, um, in cloud are reliability and security. And we put a lot of effort in reliability and security. And I would say that in terms of um, Rescale, we have a reliability layer. So if you submit a job to the cloud and for some reason it fails or it doesn't start, um, Rescale will automatically do the retry. And from a user point of view, that will be transparent. And from a security point of view, we have things like strict access controls and we have encryption, both uh, in transfer and at rest, and we comply with all the security standards, and maybe I didn't list them all, but there's more. Another challenge is simple user interface. For people who've been um, in HPC for 20, 30 years, they used to job queues and job schedulers. What I hear from our customers is newer people coming to HPC or people who haven't used HPC before are not that excited about using a job scheduler and scripting. Well, you have both types of access. We have a GUI and we have a CLI API access uh, to Rescale. But in the GUI, what you're doing here is first, you select the application to run or the type of workflow you wanna run and, and you, you select that here. And then it's gonna list below all the possible uh, machine architectures you can run this on. And on top is gonna put the ones where it's gonna run best in terms of performance and price performance and it's gonna give you the price per hour of running on, on one node or the other node. And as you select the node, it's gonna ask you how many cores you want, and typically you're gonna put more or less nodes depending on the job you wanna run. It's gonna give you the price uh, at which this is gonna to run total in terms of hardware price, software price. You can either pay as you go or bring your own license if you have your own license, and then you're able to just run the job in the cloud. This is some of our customers. Um, some customers don't want us to talk about them, so they don't give us their logo, but we have customers in the top companies in aerospace, in automotive, et cetera, um, and, and all these spaces. So this is some of our customers listed here. Um, growing significantly. The company has grown inside. I joined three months ago. They told me a year ago there were like 17 people. Uh, now the company has you know, 50, 60 people. So it's growing pretty fast. Uh, in terms of the company itself, uh, I mentioned founded in 2011, um, and then um, we have uh, more than 60 data centers across the world that we use from these cloud providers. We have some specialty providers that provide, for example, the latest architecture we offer today, the P100 uh, GPU that is not available perhaps on Amazon or Azure, but it's available through the specialty providers. So we put all that together when we offer this in the space. Um, I talked about customers and the industry sectors we're in. And there's some of our founders. Um, the early, early on were Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, Peter Thiel. There was a second round of funding uh, where all these um, investors uh, have, them, have formed part of it. So let me talk now about HPC on-premises and in the cloud in what I call hybrid. Um, so phase one, I cover HPC on-premises. Phase two, I cover HPC in the cloud. And now I'm gonna share uh, thoughts on how to do hybrid HPC on-premises and in the cloud and why. So in terms of incorporating cloud and HPC, um, our view is cloud is a paradigm shift. It is a disruption. So in the same way, I talked about the disruptions that happened early, like going from a proprietary architecture to, um, um, to clusters of commodity nodes. That, that's a disruption. It changed the way we think. It changed the way things work. It changed the algorithm, et cetera. Um, I think uh, it, it, when we go to cloud, it is a disruption because you have no system in-house. You don't need a data center. You don't need power and cooling. You don't need 
uh, maybe you need staff to manage that. Uh, in, if you go totally to the cloud, um, when you submit jobs, there's no job scheduler in queue, there's no way. So it's a big change on how things work and we have to figure out how it works. So the view, if it's a disruption and it's change uh, and everything we've done so far, all the existing processes are set up for in-house systems. Everything we've done set up for in-house systems, companies have policies, they cannot put things in the cloud. Um, we have a procurement process that every three to five years they go by a big computer all of this needs to change if you really want to incorporate cloud and take advantage of the benefits of cloud. That would be access to all the CPUs, the architecture you needed, et cetera. So our suggested approach is agree on the future we attempt to build and collaborate between uh, rescaling the customer on how to build together or jointly advance towards that future. And I'm biased because uh, I was head of innovation at Ericsson and we did a lot of uh, prototyping in the innovation space, which is you have an idea, you go fast prototype that idea, you learn from that first prototype and maybe kind of rough, and then you evolve that quickly and you iterate, and then what you build is much more in line with the results than if you plan everything for three years and you build it. I honestly think that if you plan for three years and you're going to decide between Cray, SGI, Dell, HP, etc., or Rescale in three years, all or nothing, you're just gonna choose one of the standard providers because you're not gonna make that huge all or nothing transition. So what we're gonna show is a process where we start going to the cloud quickly, but in a smaller amount, and then you move to a larger uh, move to the cloud as you move towards the future. And maybe the future is just hybrid. It's not the future is all in the cloud because you, know, you have things already running in house that you may not have a need to transition to the cloud. So, Future state, imagine, and this is kind of what I think about imagining the future helps. Imagine a future where jobs run in the cloud, you have instant access to unlimited resources, you have a choice of architectures, the applications are available in tune, applications run on the best suited architecture, jobs run with no weight, engineers are not constrained by the size of the system, you get to faster innovation, shorter cycles, improve time to market, provision when you need so you don't have to wait, and no capital investment. And that's a I view that as a desirable future. When I talk to an engineer and, and sees that, yeah, I want that. Sometimes I'm constrained by, by the current machine. So I, I want that, right? So if that's the future, how do we get there? Well, the thought is uh, to have a process by which we continue to run on-premise. Let me skip this slide because I just have the, the visual here more easily. Here's an example of how we think we can incorporate cloud in HPC. First is stay, stage one, you take some of the jobs and you move them to the cloud and you use the directly the rescale portal, GUI or API or API, and connect to the rescale cloud. So a few jobs, you move them to the cloud and use the rescale portal directly. You ask me, why do I want to do that? Well, if you think about the future where you use the cloud directly and you have all the benefits of cloud, that future is going to look like that. It's going to look like the top part of this. It's not going to be um, encumbered by, by having a system in-house. So if you think about the mode where you're submitting jobs to the guy, I always thought that submitting jobs to the in-house system and have a way to overflow the occasional job was a good thing. That was my thought until yeah, a month ago. But now I'm thinking that that job sort of ties you to the current on-premise model. It doesn't give you all the advantages of cloud. And by the time you want to overflow a job to the cloud, that job may be the wrong one to move to the cloud. I think to take really advantage of cloud, you want to choose jobs that are going to take advantage of cloud because either they need the variability, they need to use different architectures, etc. So I believe it is a best approach, a better approach, to select some of the jobs that will take advantage of cloud and move those to the cloud. That doesn't mean moving everything. That means you're still running, I don't know, if there's a wall of 99% and 1%, well, Still 99% is running in-house in the same way we always run it. But you're doing sort of the innovation with uh, a few jobs that you're going to move to the cloud, that are going to experience this new world. And by doing that, um, you're going to learn. You're going to learn that using the cloud either works very well for some applications and not for others, or maybe your, your high-speed links need to be faster, or maybe the internal policies are not allowing you to move to the cloud, or you have to talk to your security department to be able to do this. By moving a few jobs, you're gonna hit the wall a few times, so you're gonna learn from that. We're gonna learn together, we're gonna help you customize your environment, and you'll be able to start moving more jobs to the cloud. 
if you do this and then you iterate, which would be the next step, learn from experience, iterate, move bigger jobs and more users to the cloud and you refine the implementation, what's going to happen is in three years, when you make the decision between cloud and on-premise, you know, run a number of jobs in the cloud and bigger jobs and you know exactly what's good to run in the cloud and what's good to have on-premises. So my view is what we should do is effectively start with cloud quickly and then evolve it. And I think I wrote it here as um, a top 10, 10 things to do. Start testing cloud right away, start small, pick a few projects that will benefit from cloud HPC, test the future experience. And I'm putting emphasis on the word experience. It's not about doing a benchmark. It's about testing the future experience of running the cloud. I think my fifth point is don't try to solve all the problems before you start, because if we plan this forever, it's going to take a long time to get going, and we're not going to learn as much. Use the cloud directly, connect to the rescale portal and run your jobs that way, so you take advantage of the flexibility of everything. Learn from the experience, iterate, address and cover issues, and then select more projects, go bigger scope, and more people and add more people. So the, the main point is cloud is an all or nothing. It's not that you're deciding if you're going to buy a Cray system or an HPE system, and now you stuck with it for the next five years, so you make it a big procurement. You can, instead of spending $5 million right away, you can spend about 100K instead of $5 million, and you're able to run cloud, a number of jobs, a number of different projects, learn from that while you get real work done. So after you, um, you run the first jobs in the cloud, the second thing you can do is you can use the rescale portal to also submit jobs on premise. So now you have some people that are already using the rescale portal to submit jobs in the cloud, but now they have the possibility to also submit jobs on premise while you continue to run jobs the, the normal way you have run on premises. So how would this work? Well, this would work is I'm using the rescale interface. I selected an application to run and I can even submit it to this uh, architecture in the cloud or submit it to this other architecture that happens to be on-premises. From a user point of view, I just get one way to submit jobs on-premises into the cloud. If we take this to the next level, and that may sound a bit more radical, is let's say you move a number of jobs from on-premises to the cloud. Now I freed up a bit of my machine. So what do I do when I, when I have my machine sort of idle? Well, you have a fantastic opportunity to now take a piece of your system, free cycles or whatever, and put those in the rescale cloud. So the same way Ohio Supercomputer has their system on the rescale cloud and people can submit jobs there, now you can put your system or a piece of your system in the rescale cloud and offer your systems for external access, and you have control. You can say, well, I'm only going to allow my suppliers to use my system through the rescale cloud, or I want to open it to the world. In any case, all the use will be tracked and you can get what we call rescale credit dollars. So as people use your system, you get credit and then imagine you only have CPUs and no GPUs. Well, then as people use your CPUs, you get credit dollars and as you have credit dollars, you can use GPUs in the cloud. So I think that gives you a good experience. The other thing I was going to say, when you use in-house systems, all your in-house systems will be pulled behind this uh, portal. So you'll be able to submit jobs to machines from different departments, etc. And you can imagine a future where you just go into that mode. You have a hybrid world or you have systems in-house, uh, you use the cloud and some of your systems uh, are available through the rescale cloud. We work with customers in a collaborative way. One way is we can just talk to you about how to move jobs to the cloud, but we also have done like consulting agreements where we say, okay, here's an example of a consulting agreement where at the beginning we sit down with you, understand your goals, and then we got to go through multiple phases where you're going to be uh, running the different levels of workloads in the cloud with us, with us just advising you on what to move to the cloud. We have people with a lot of expertise of HPC applications and HPC in the cloud. And they will just know uh, what will run better in the cloud. So as you move your jobs, we're going to get the feedback we want to work with you going forward. Um, in the future, we expect all these things will come together. I mentioned some examples of the virtual um, um, car, virtual racing, for example, with big data in IoT, uh, the digital twins, as I was example, uh, uh, giving the example of Boom. 
Um, I think it's going to be a combination of HPC and deep learning that can happen all in the cloud. And one thing I didn't mention in particular is we have what we call the Scalex Lab, where we have the latest hardware available in partnership with companies like Intel. And they're going to put, put the latest hardware so you can access very quickly without having to buy it, so you can test it very quickly uh, in the future. Uh, if you're interested in this topic, I wrote a blog called uh, Cloud, the Next Disruption in HPC, which is in blog uh, reskill.com. And with that, I'm going to finish my part. Uh, for, the, for the first time, Rescale is going to be at the supercomputing show at C17 in Denver. Um, so if you go to Denver, you can find me or you can find some of the other Rescale people, and we can talk more about incorporating cloud in HPC. With that, I'll turn it over to Mika. Okay, thanks, Gabriel. Uh, we're pretty much out of time, so we're going to wrap things up. Thank you again to all of you for attending, and uh, goodbye. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.